بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته From the beginning of time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for the sons of Adam to have an enemy This enemy's role is to misguide the son of Adam to take him away from knowing his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala to make difficult for him his path back to the garden where he belongs to make difficult for him having a connection with his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala so he can enjoy his life in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to enjoy his life. So Allah Azawajal, he told us in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِينَ عَدُوًا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِ Likewise, we have made for every prophet an enemy from amongst the jinn and from amongst mankind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put forth the enemy for mankind as a test to see how will mankind behave? How will they react to this enemy? Will they follow the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set forth? Or will they become from those who got astray and fall into the whisperings and the traps that shaitan puts forth? Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says in his book, Madarja Salikin, Wala shay ahab ilallahi ta'ala min muraghamati abdi, min muraghamati waliyihi li'aduwihi wa ighadatihi lahu. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, there is nothing more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the wali of Allah azawajal, the close worshipper and friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who humiliates the enemy and enrages the enemy for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does he humiliate the enemy? By not listening to him. How does he enrage the enemy? By doing that which Allah azawajal has chosen rather than doing that which the devils have chosen. The believer, he has to be aware and he has to pay attention as to what is taking place in this continual struggle between him and the devils of the jinn and the devils of mankind. Because if he becomes careless, as many of us do, and if he lets his guard down, as many of us do, he will find that without even realizing how he will end up in a very bad situation between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will find that he will go from a position of being one who worships Allah, may Allah protect us from all, to being from the position of one who is in complete disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he won't know how that took place. But how that took place is because he let his guard down. How that took place is because he or she became careless. Because he or she forgot to think about the enemy that is always there, the relentless enemy, the enemy that is always plotting and planning, the enemy that doesn't give up, doesn't go to sleep, the enemy that has thousands of years of experience in misguiding the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this enemy, he says in the Quran, for example, Listen carefully what he says. This is Allah quoting the words of your enemy. So Shaitan, he says, Oh my Lord, because of what you have led me astray, I'm going to sit on the path that you have guided them to. I'm going to sit and wait for them. And then I'm going to come in front of them and from behind them and from their right and from their left and I will misguide them and you won't find many of them grateful to you. So look at the evilness of shaitan. First and foremost, look how rotten his soul is. Look how rotten his being is that he blames Allah Azawajal for his misguidance. And we should know that we should never fall into the same trap. That if we find ourselves doing something wrong, don't blame others for what you are doing wrong. Blame yourself and take yourself to account. So shaitan, he says, I'm going to sit on the path that you have made for them, the sirat al-mustaqeem, the path which leads to the pleasure of Allah. So don't think just because you are here now worshipping Allah, don't think just because you are walking the path of the sirat al-mustaqeem that it's going to be that easy, that you're going to reach your destination without any trials and tribulations, without any temptations, without any battles from the jinn and from the shayateen of the mankind. No, it's as the shaitan said, he will come from in front of you, from behind you, from your right and from your left, and continually try to misguide us. So we have to be aware. We have to ensure that we have our guard fully up. We have to know who our enemy is. We have to learn how to protect ourselves.
from this enemy and we have to try our best to abstain from what he is whispering us to. This battle, it doesn't stop as I said. It doesn't stop. Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned his, in his great book, al Bidayat wa Nihaya, an amazing story. He mentions when he speaks about the death of Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahl Sunnah rahimahullah ta'ala. When this Imam was dying, his son narrates to us, Abdullah, that my father was on his deathbed, coming in and out of the stupors of death. And he was saying, la ba'd, la ba'd, not yet, not yet. And the people that were around him, they became nervous. Why is he saying not yet, not yet, and we are making for him talqeen? What is talqeen that you do when somebody is close to passing away? Laqin mawtakum la ilaha illallah. The Prophet ﷺ advised that when the person is close to death, you advise the person to say la ilaha illallah. Because the one who leaves the dunya by saying la ilaha illallah, then he will have his sins forgiven. And it's not that you should stress to the person, you must say la ilaha illallah. Rather, it's you sit around him and you remind the person by you yourself, saying la ilaha illallah continually. So this was being said in front of the Imam of Ahl Sunnah from the greatest of worshippers of Allah Azawajal. But he was saying la ba'd, la ba'd, not yet, not yet. So his son and the companions around him, they became worried. So when the Imam, he regained consciousness for a few moments, they asked him, Oh my father, what is taking place? Why are you saying not yet, not yet? He said, I see shaitan in the corner of the room, biting onto his hands, saying, Oh Imam, you have escaped my plots. You have escaped my plots and you have been saved. So the Imam, knowing the plots of shaitan and knowing how serious the matter is, he said, not yet, not yet, until my soul leaves my body. That's how serious it is. It doesn't stop. Let's not kid ourselves. Let's not think that we can escape these plots. It will take place till the last breath. So we have to be aware and we have to be careful to the last breath that we take. And Imam Ahmed, he collects a hadith which explains this even further. He collects the hadith where it's mentioned that inna shaytan qal, Ya Rab, wa is zatika, la abrahu aghwi ibadaka, ma damat arwahum fi al sadihim. He said, Shaytan, O oh my Lord, by your honor, I'm going to continually misguide your slaves as long as their souls are in their bodies. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa is zati wa jalali, la azalu aghfira lahum mastagfaruni. By my honor, I will continue to forgive them as long as they see forgiveness from me. So of course the matter is serious, but there's always hope. As long as you're sincerely trying to seek forgiveness from Allah every time you make a mistake, there's always hope. But don't be deluded. Don't think that this attack is not serious. And don't be lazy and don't be careless, not taking care of yourself and care of your families. We have to be aware of what is taking place. From the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you know, is that he didn't leave us without the tools that we require for us to live a fruitful life and to live in a way which will save us from the plots of shaitan and to live in a way which will protect us from the evil of the jinn and the ints. So Shaykh Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, for example, he says, the one who says the morning and evening adhkar, the du'as in the morning and the du'as in the evening, with his heart being present, Meaning that number one, you understand the meaning of those words. And number two, you are interacting with the meaning of those no words. It's not just something which is robotic. You just go through them as quick as you can. Rather, you ponder upon them and you truly seek Allah's protection from these words. He said, if you do so, you will have a protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is stronger than the wall which is now blocking Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Ponder that. Your protection will be that strong from the shayateen. But if only you implement that. But if you don't bother to learn these du'as, and you don't bother to learn the adhkar, and to take the means that protect you from the shaitan, then you become as one who really just gets led astray. One of the callers of Islam which is alive today, and he's a famous caller, he mentions a story whereby he was making ruqya on a person who was possessed by jinn. So the jinn left the body, but then after a while, a few moments, re-entered the body again. So the sheikh, he continued to recite upon the person. The raqi continued to recite. Again, the jinn left, but as it left, it struck the person that it had possessed. So the jinn, 
was communicating also with the sheikh. And the sheikh said to him, you struck this person, but why didn't you strike me? He said, I didn't have the ability to come near you. I didn't have the ability to harm you. The sheikh said, why? He said, because you said in the morning three times, the dua, Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma asmihi shay'un fil ard wa la fil sama wa huwa sami'u al-alim. He said this dua, the one that we are recommended to say, that in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing in the heavens and the earth can harm with his name, and he is the one that hears all and knows all. So if you say these morning du'as in the right way, pondering upon them, you will be protected by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you don't bother, then you are like the poet says, تَرْجُ النَّجَاتَ وَلَمْ تَسْلُقْ مَسَالِكَهَا إِنَّ سَفِينَةَ لَا تَجْرِ عَلَى الْيَبَسِ You want to be protected, you want to be saved, but you don't take the paths of protection. Verily the ship, it doesn't sail on dry land. For you to move forward and you to move close to Allah Azawajal, for you to be protected, you have to take the means. You have to establish the means for yourself and for your family. Without that, it's just wishful thinking. We are just deluding ourselves. From the best of protections, apart from saying the morning and the evening du'as, is to establish and to learn and to always continue to establish tawheed in your lives and sincerity in your lives. Because the more you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His rights upon you, the more you learn about the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you learn about the tawheed of Allah azawajal, the more you learn how to have sincerity with Allah azawajal, what's taking place in your heart? You are always connected with Allah, right? You're always thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In every action that you, you do, you are holding yourself to account to be sincere to Allah. So you're connected to Allah. You're always thinking about the tawheed of Allah azawajal in every place you are, in everything that you do. And this causes you to have a good connection with Allah and for you to be protected. So Allah azawajal says, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ سُلْطَانٌ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Verily the devil, he doesn't have an ability upon those who have belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And belief from the most important parts of it is to have tawheed. And from those who have reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you have true belief in Allah azawajal, consisting of tawheed and sincerity and re rely upon Allah azawajal, then inshallah by the permission of Allah you are protected from that which comes to you in a harmful manner from the shaitan and the devils of mankind. From the most important ways of protecting yourself from shaitan is what Allah azawajal mentions in the Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu udhkurullaha dhikran kathira. O oh, you who believe Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, much remembrance. O oh, you who believe, always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says, commenting on this verse, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for every obligation that he has given the son of Adam, he has put a measurement of how much you should do of that obligation. Fasting, how much you should fast. Praying, how much you should pray. Zakah, how much you should give zakah. Hajj, when you should go and how many times it should be. Every obligation, there's a measurement except for the obligation of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, there's no measurement. You do it openly and as much as you can. And in every obligation, the son of Adam is excused if he cannot do that obligation, but not with dhikr. With dhikr, you are not excused. You are to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every situation, Unless you have lost your mind, of course. May Allah protect us from that. If you lose your mind, then you are unable to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah commands us that in every situation, we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Tirmidhi, he collects in a long hadith, and the hadith is authenticated by Shaykh Al-Bani rahimahullah ta'ala, where he quotes that Yahya ibn Zakariya alayhi salam, he was giving some advice to his followers. He said, I command you wa amurukum and tadkurullaha fa inna mathala dalik kamathli rajul. He said, I command you to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Why? Because the likeness of that is like a man who is being chased by his enemy. His enemy is chasing him relentlessly. And this man is running from his enemy. And he reaches a place where he finds a fortress that he can protect himself with. So none can protect themselves from his enemy except by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot protect yourself, as mentioned by Yahya ibn Zakari alayhi salam, except by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Did anybody play the Pac-Man game when they were young or do they still play it now? Do you remember that game? What was it about? 
you have these crazy creatures trying to chase you while you're trying to gain as many points as you can and you have a, a, a limited amount of time. That is our life. We're trying to gain as many good deeds as we can before the time runs out. And we have these crazy creatures, the shayateen of the jinn and the ins, chasing us, trying to harm us, trying to prevent us from gaining these points that will help us to enter into Jannah. But the more you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you'll be able to go through the levels of that game of life, one after the other, getting closer to your final objective, which is to enter into Jannah by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we said that dhikr is from the best ways to protect yourself. Like what is the best of dhikr? This is from the best of dhikr, of course, and there are many. But what is from the best of dhikr? Huh? To read the Qur'an, right? As many of the ulama said, such as Imam Nawi, Ibn Taymiyyah, and others, they said the reading of the Qur'an is the best of remembrance. Because in the Qur'an, first and foremost, you are establishing a relationship with Allah Azawajal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to you. You are learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His commands and His prohibitions. And the best of dhikr after that is that you establish those commands and prohibitions. You do what Allah wants you to do and you avoid what Allah wants you to avoid. Because every time you're doing what Allah wants you to do, you're remembering Allah, right? Every time you're avoiding what Allah wants you to do, you're remembering Allah. You only do it because you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Quran is from the best of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which surah, if you read it in the Quran, brings up protection for you, a barrier between you and the influence of the devils in your house, protects you and your family? Which surah is that? Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, as in Sahih Muslim, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورا فإن الشيطان ينفر من البيت الذي تقرأ فيه سورة البقرة. Don't make your houses like graves. Read in them Surah Al-Baqarah, for verily shaitan will flee from a house wherein Surah Al-Baqarah is read. Don't you want that for yourselves? A protection between you and for your family from the devils, the influence that they come with, destroying household after household. But if we read this Surah continually every three days, then we are protected by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib, what about playing the Surah in your house? Does that bring the same benefit? Inshallah, we hope so. That's the good answer because we hope from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it does. So many of the scholars, they said it doesn't because it's an act of worship and for an act of worship, you require the intention. It doesn't suffice you to just play the tashjil, to play the recorder. But other scholars like uh, Shaykh Ibn Baz, ta'ala, he said rather we hope that it does suffice. Especially if you find difficulty in reciting the Quran, then until you become proficient in reciting the Quran, we hope that it will suffice you because the hadith it said, Tuqra'u, the, hadith, the, the house in which it is read. So this person is reading even though it's on a recorder. So we hope from the permission of Allah that it suffices. But without a doubt, without a doubt, reading it is better. And that is what should be done. But if you find difficulty, then don't that make that prevent you from having Surah Al-Baqarah played in your house as much as you can. Especially that some of the ulama, they allowed this to happen. What should be read from this surah, this great surah, before going to bed for protection? from the jinn, from the devils. Hmm? Ayatul Kursi, right? And this is mentioned in the hadith where Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he mentions the long hadith where he was put in charge by the Prophet sallallahu of protecting the sadaqah, the different types of sadaqah that was collected. So one night Abu Huraira, he said, I was guarding the zakat, the sadaqah, and I found a person rummaging through that sadaqah. So I grabbed this person because he was trying to steal. And I said, I'm going to take you to the Prophet ﷺ. So the person, he begged me. Said, he said, I have needs. Please do not take me. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, like most of the companions, he had a very soft heart. So he let this person go. The next day he went to the Prophet ﷺ. He told him what happened. The Prophet ﷺ said he will return. And this happened three nights consecutively. On the last night when Abu Huraira grabbed him, he said, I'm not going to let you go. This time for sure I'm going to take you. So this person who he thought was a person, rather it was a devil from the jinn, he said, I will tell you something, that if you do this, then you will be protected from the devils. He said, before you go to bed, read Ayatul Kusri. He said, if you read this, then they will continue to be upon you, a protector from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and no devil will be able to approach you until you wake up in the morning. 
So he let him go. And then Abu Hurairah the next day he told the Prophet ﷺ what had been mentioned to him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaqaka wa huwa kadhub. He told you the truth, but he is a liar. For verily he was a devil. But he told you the truth. So this is something we should do. We should teach ourselves and teach our children that before we go to the bed in the evening, in night, we should read that um, ayah, Ayatul Kursi, for verily it is from the best of protections. From the best of protections, Wherever you be on the face of the earth, wherever you are traveling, wherever you be at work, at home, in the shopping centers, is that you say, as mentioned in Sahih Muslim by Khawla bint al-Hakim radiyallahu anha, where she said, سَمَعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولُ مَنْ نَزَلَ مَنْزِلًا فَقَالْ أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ أَتَّامَاتِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ لَمْ يَضُرُّهُ شَيْءْ حَتَّى يَرْحَلَ مِنْ مَنْزِلِهِ ذَلِكَ She said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say Whoever enters upon a place or stops at a place and says, I seek refuge in the perfect words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any evil that he created, then nothing will harm him in that place until he leaves that place. If you say these words. So these words are from the best of protections. I saw a video where a brother, he was camping with some brothers in the desert. He said we recited this as this is from the sunnah for us to recite. When we woke up in the morning and we picked up our mattresses to put away, we found under our mattresses huge scorpions. And I saw that. He actually recorded what he found. Huge scorpions were under his mattress, but nothing touched them. Subhanallah, they were protected from that evil that was there. Why? Because they remembered to say the du'as and the adhkar that Allah has given with sincerity and with understanding of the meaning. You say it correctly with understanding then by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be protected from the harm of the devils. What is shaitan's biggest desire for you? What is his end goal from his plots and his planning? Huh? To make you what? Somebody said it. To make you fall into shirk and kufr, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, كَمَثْلِ shaitan it قَالَ الْإِنسَانُ كُفُرُ فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ so shaitan, he said to one of mankind, one of the sons of Adam, commit kufr, fall into kufr. And when this person did, shaitan says, I am now free from you because verily I fear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of the ulama, the mufassirin, they mentioned a story pertaining to this verse. They said that this story is the story of a person known as Barsisa, who is a worshipper from the worshippers of Bani Israel. Now this worshipper, he used to live in a monastery, but beside the monastery, he would have a house, not too far from it. In this time, there were a group of brothers that wanted to go and worship Allah Azawajal by doing from that which is the greatest acts of worship, they wanted to make jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the problem was they had a sister, and they didn't know who would be able to take care of this woman, this young lady. So they went to Basisa, and they suggested to him that, please, we beg you, we are going to make jihad in the path of Allah Azawajal. Please take care of our sister for us. Parsisa, he was absolutely shocked. He said, no way on the face of this earth will I do that. Keep her away from me. But they persisted day after day, week after week. They said, there's nobody else. Do you want us not to go on this mission and to help the ummah and to help establish kalimatul la ilaha illallah on the earth? So Parsisa, he finally gave in. He said, put in the house and I will stay in the monastery. Put in the house over there, I will stay in the monastery. So Barsisa, every morning he would go leave food outside for her and go back to his monastery and carry on worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happened? Over time, shaitan came to him and started whispering to him day after day, moment after moment. Why are you leaving the food outside the house? So she has to come out and show herself to those who may be walking by. Rather, what you should be doing, the right thing, is you should put the food inside the house. So was he telling him a bad thing or a good thing? He was telling him a good thing on the apparent. So Barsisa, after many days of whispering, he gave in and he started to put the food inside the house and leave. Then Shaitan whispered to him the next step. He said, look, she's lonely. At least check on her. At least ask her, shout. She's probably upstairs, shout from downstairs at the door. Is everything okay? Is there anything I can do for you? So Barsisa, after many weeks of hearing this whispering, he gave in. He started to shout to her, are you okay? Is there anything that you need? And he would go back to his monastery and worship Allah. Shaitan continued the whisper. 
He said, she's a human being. Everybody goes crazy if they don't have anyone to communicate with. At least speak to her. Sit with her for a few moments and make sure that she's okay. You're a worshiper of Allah. You can protect yourself. She's young. You won't even be attracted to her. But what took place? When they sat together, Shaitan made him beautiful in her eyes and her beautiful in his eyes. And what happened, happened. And Barsisa fell into the traps of Shaitan. And this woman, young lady, she ended up having child from Barsisa. So now Barsisa in a state of panic and worry and shame. That, oh my God, how have I ended up in this situation? Me, Basis, the worship of Allah, who lives in the monastery, how did I end up in this situation? So Shaitan, he comes to him night after night, whispering to him, you have to solve this problem before the brothers, they come back. You have to kill this woman and you have to bury her with her child. Don't worry, afterwards you can make Toba. So Shaitan comes and he makes this seem like a fair-minded proposal to Basisa. Basisa finally does it. He kills the woman, he buries her with her child, and he thinks that the story is done. Time goes by and these brothers, they come back from jihad. And they come to see Barsisa to regain or to collect their beloved sister. Barsisa says, she became ill, she died, I had to bury her outside in the grave, in the graveyard. The brothers, they said to him, Jazakallah khair, you did what you could, you tried your best, may Allah reward you. They went away. Barsisa came to this group of brothers whilst they were in their sleep. And he gave each one of them the same dream, which was that your sister was killed whilst pregnant by this monk. So the brothers, they woke up in the morning and each one of them narrated the story to one another. And they said, this must be true. How can it be that all of us receive the same story? So they went in rage to Barsisa and they roughed him up until they made him admit that he had actually done this heinous crime. So they were enraged. They said, we're going to take you and we're going to take you to the king so that he will judge you and he will inflict upon you the hadood of Islam. So on his way, being taken, Barsisa was visited by the shaitan. How? We don't know, but he was visited. And he said to Barsisa, you know that it was me who led you into this difficulty. You know, step by step, I caused you this problem. And you know that none can get you out of this trouble except for me. So worship prostrate to me and I will remove you from this difficulty. So Barsisa, th he thought to himself, one prostration, I'll make it, I'll be removed from this situation and then I will make tawbah and carry on my life. So he makes the prostration to shaitan and what happens to him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes his life at that moment. So look at the point. The point is that this enemy, this relentless enemy, he comes to the best of worshippers, step by step, inch by inch, Moment after moment, he can take us from being a worshiper of Allah Azawajal to being from those who are cursed. So never feel safe. Never think that this is an easy journey. The journey is difficult, but it's easy for the one who remains in the company of Allah. And the difficulties, you are going to be rewarded immensely for them. But don't fall into the traps of shaitan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in the Quran, in the very important verse, Ya ayyuhal nas, kullu ma min kullu. Don't follow the steps of shaitan. Allah told us that they are steps. He's not going to come to you in one go and say do X, Y, and Z from the fahsha and the munkar. But he's going to come to you step by step. He guides you to do all types of evil and all types of sexual deviance and to speak about Allah without have, uh, having any knowledge. So this is the end goal of shaitan, to make us fall into kufr. And how does he do it? He comes to you step by step. The lecture, justice has not been done to the topic because there's so much that needs to be mentioned. But just as an overall summary for us, the important thing is to be aware of the steps and the relentless attack. The attack is relentless. So we have to study the books of how to protect ourselves from shaitan. Because many a time shaitan, what he does, even when he finds you doing good, he doesn't come and now tell you to stop doing the good. What he will tell you to do is to do good, but an act of worship which is in less in quality or in sight, in Allah's sight, than another act of worship which would be higher. So he even confuses you in that manner. He will make you choose the acts of worship which are less in the sight of Allah. You could have done a better act, but he will make you choose the lesser act. So he comes to you in the strangest of ways. 
So we have to go back to the ulama and find out the ways that we should protect ourselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that are close to Allah azawajal, ameen, and that are protected by his words and the deeds which he has told us to do. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, any mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. So the brother, he's asking an important question. He's saying, look, if this worshiper was misled by shaitan, then what is it that we can do to protect ourselves from shaitan? Everything that I mentioned will protect you from shaitan. And as Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned that, look, the reality is that nobody is misled unless they had some type of disease which was hidden in their heart. So what takes place is that you find that when a person is put under pressure with, uh, by a tribulation or by temptation, it's because he had some hidden defect in his heart. That's why the protection didn't protect him. It's not because the words of Allah weren't true. It was because he didn't make tawbah from a particular sin or he had some kind of disease hidden in his heart. So that's probably what happened in the story of Persisa that we mentioned. But Allah will always protect his slaves and loves to protect his slaves if his slave is sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib, zakallah khair. The greatest of the roads is your road, that you will go home and implement what you hear. You will go home and make the effort to bring other people to what you heard. That is from the greatest of roles, okay? So ensure that you get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for doing so. Wa jazakumullah khair, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.